But tú trabajas con I hate to interrupt director. good conversations that are going on here. I want to welcome you to the Woodrow Wilson Center for a very important set of discussions today. We're going to start with a lunch discussion. Duncan Wood is going to present some work he's been doing um, with the Wilson Center on renewable energy. We have the fortune of uh, having Liliana comment on this before she heads to Mexico um, on, on behalf of the Mexican government. Um, and I uh, just want to welcome you to the Woodrow Wilson Center. I apologize ahead of time. Like Liliana, I'm actually headed out to Mexico as well today, so I'll slip out a little bit early as well. Um, but I know this is going to be a fantastic session, and let me turn you over to my colleague, Chris Wilson. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, my name is Chris Wilson with the Mexico Institute as well, and thank you also very much for coming today. Uh, we're going to get started. I think we'll have a few more people come in, but uh, we'll, uh, please enjoy your lunch as we uh, have our presentations. So we're very lucky to have with us uh, Duncan Wood. Uh, who is a man of many hats. Uh, he is a professor of international relations at the ITAM, or the Instituto Autónomo uh, Tecnológico. Tecnológico. I got it Autónomo backwards there. Tecnológico Autónomo de México uh, in Mexico City. Uh, in addition to that, he's also, uh, he works at CSIS, the other think tank in town on Mexico issues, as well as being working here with us at the Mexico Institute. Uh, he's in charge of our renewable energy initiative and is also working on a, a variety of other energy issues. Uh, he's just a, a fabulous researcher, a uh, great uh, presenter. We're very lucky to have him with us today. And he'll be presenting the sort of preliminary results of his latest research on the use of renewable energies, development of renewable energy uh, along the border, focused on, in particular, along the Mexico side of the border, which will complement very well the rest of our presentation from the GNAB today. Uh, we're also delighted to have with us Liliana Ferrer, uh, who's the head of section for the political and border affairs at the Embassy of Mexico, and she'll be commenting on Duncan's presentation. I'll give her a little bit more thorough introduction as uh, we get through the presentation. So, Duncan, I'll just pass it over to you and take it away. Thank you, Chris. Oh, um, I'm sorry, can I yeah, say one more please. thing? I want to apologize. We have, uh, we have presentations uh, for some that some of you may have uh, the printouts of Duncan's PowerPoint. You may notice that they actually only have the odd pages, so <laughs> you'll, only, you'll only be able to follow half of the presentation if you use those. We're trying to get some more copies printed and distributed around if you'd like to follow along that way, but fortunately we have the entire presentation on the, really? on the screen. And don't worry, Chris, most of my pages are odd anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, well, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm delighted that we get to do this in the same forum as, uh, as you guys presenting your report, the GNEB, uh, GNEB report, um, which... Uh, I've been in contact with many of you over the past year, um, and uh, I was lucky enough to be with you up in uh, Las Cruces, um, where you were talking about the, uh, the progress on the report, and so it's great to see the, uh, the final version here. And just by briefly leafing through this, I think there's uh, enormous complementarities that we're seeing with the work that uh, we're doing here at the Wilson Center and in Mexico City on, uh, on renewable energies at the border. I have an enormously long presentation today, which I'm going to skip through, and I don't want to bore you with all the details. When the, um, the even pages arrive for the presentation, um, you can have a look at them at your leisure. Um, I thought this was Chris actually trying to cut short my presentation. It's like, well, <laughs> I can only present every second page or what? Um, but anyway. Um, let me just begin uh, with a brief overview of what uh, our project here is all about. The idea was to study uh, the impact or the potential impact of uh, renewable energy in Mexican border states with an eye to economic benefits, uh, the creation of uh, human capital knowledge spillover networks, and social participation. Now, this is based upon preliminary work that we've done a couple of years ago, looking at some renewable energy projects um, in various parts of Mexico and uh, taking sort of early lessons from what we'd seen there uh, and to see how we could uh, really get the most juice out of the renewable energy uh, uh, issue at, in, in border states. And so on the economic benefits, we're looking predominantly not just at the, uh, the generation of electricity and energy in general, but the creation of jobs, investment, etc. things that I know that the, um, the Good Neighbor Environmental Board has been looking at as well. Um, in terms of knowledge spillover and the development of human capital, um, looking at the possibilities for creating clusters, looking at the, uh, the possibility of creating training programs, working with universities um, and knowledge-based networks, social participation to see ways in which local communities can be incorporated into renewable energy projects so that they actually become real stakeholders in the, uh, in the process. And there have been, as I'll talk about a little bit later on, there have been some negative lessons from that from other projects in other parts of, uh, of Mexico. The background uh, to this is uh, just to say that we've been working on renewable energy issues in Mexico for the past couple of years. 
um, and we've been focused predominantly on U.S.-Mexico cooperation. Um, we issued a report last year on this, which sort of gave a history of U.S.-Mexico cooperation in, uh, in renewable energies. Um, and one of the issues that came out of that was the rising demand for clean energies um, in certain U.S. states. Um, and, of course, you know, the predominance of the California Renewable Portfolio Standard. Uh, and then we're looking at the challenges and opportunities that exist along the border. And uh, to, uh, to borrow a slide from uh, Maria Elena's uh, excellent report on the uh, future of greenhouse gas emissions along the border, um, it, it's, uh, it's impressive to see that uh, how important the Mexican border states are in the overall portfolio of carbon gas emissions uh, for Mexico and to see the impressive growth that is predicted for the future. So on a purely environmental level, it's important that, uh, we're, that we begin to attack um, greenhouse gas emissions by promoting certain renewable energies, the best kinds of renewable energies for each specific area along the border. And whilst it will not by any means solve this problem on its own, it has to be part of the portfolio that we, pre that we present. Now, um, Mexico is a country, as many of you will know, that is incredibly blessed in terms of its renewable energy resources. Um, in addition to hydroelectric, which uh, uh, some people say is more or less tapped out, there's not much room for expansion, at least on the, on the large scale. Other people say that through, uh, through micro-generation, the small-scale hydro-generation, there is potential for, for growing uh, generation there. But uh, leaving that aside, there are four main areas in Mexico which, uh, which have real potential. Um, there's the geothermal uh, area, which Mexico is a, is a leader in uh, geothermal energy uh, generation, uh, wind, solar, and biofuels. In this report, or rather this is actually three reports that we're presenting today, um, we focused on wind, solar, and biofuels. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is that uh, on geothermal energy, um, that is entirely in the hands at the moment of, uh, of the Comisión Federal de Electricidad, um, they've been very aggressive in building that up. As I say, Mexico is a leader on that. So we decided that that was an issue that we didn't have to focus on nearly so much, and so we focused on the other three issues in, this, uh, in these reports. Beginning with, with solar, solar power, um, as those of you who uh, have studied the border um, know very well, that particular area of the world is one of the world's top uh, uh, solar resources. And uh, the, uh, the report that we've, uh, that we've commissioned from uh, Sergio Romero at the ITAM in Mexico City, one of my colleagues, um, is, uh, has, has come up with some interesting findings here. Um, that essentially a 25 kilometer by 25 kilometer square of the Sonora Desert, if it was covered with PV panels, would be able to generate enough electricity to satisfy national demand in Mexico. Now, this is, of course, a, a pipe dream. I mean, there's no way that anyone is going to invest that amount of money in covering 25 kilometers of the Sonora Desert with, uh, with PV panels. It would look interesting from space, but uh, I don't think anyone actually wants to do that. Um, but uh, it, sh it highlights the potential there. And whilst no one is thinking about uh, really mega projects in Mexico right now, it does highlight for us the importance of diversifying the Mexican energy matrix and by bringing in not just solar farms but residential applications um, across the border region as well. And I think that's what uh, one of the lessons from, from history shows us, is that there is a space in, uh, in the Mexican energy environment for solar energy. Um, we've seen it on the small scale so far. Um, over the past 20 years, the United States government has been working closely with the uh, Mexican government agencies uh, for rural applications, which have had a, uh, an incredibly positive impact upon uh, Mexican rural small businesses, um, farms, etc. Solar energy used for water pumping, solar energy used for refrigeration purposes that have really begun to turn pe people's lives around. And so that kind of development uh, dimension, I think, of solar energy at the border is very, very important. Um, but the other thing which, uh, which offers great hope, I think, for the future is the building of uh, large-scale solar facilities on the U.S. side of the border. And having spoken with uh, the private enterprises who are involved in this, they very much have an eye to the future by looking across the border to try to build up cross-border solar farms. Now, a lot of this depends upon, uh, well, a myriad of reasons, but uh, the, uh, the issue that keeps coming up is, of course, transmission. And that's something that we'll look at in depth later on. Um, this is the map that you've probably all seen many times, but uh, it, it highlights the solar resource, and I've said it's the Mexican Northwest, of course, for the United States, which actually created this, is the, it's the U.S. Southwest. But you can see the solar patterns here and how they actually uh, da -da -da, there we go. So, we cross over the border, and we've got a terrific potential right here in Sonora, 
um, but also up in Chihuahua and in uh, Baja California in the, uh, in the southeast area there. So Mexico's uh, irradiation levels mean that on average you can produce in those areas of Mexico around six kilowatt hours per day per meter squared which is an extraordinary resource. I mean, that's a, that's a world-beating resource. Um, people generally say that Mexico is, uh, is one of the top five countries in terms of solar power potential for the future. John, yes? Quick, just a quick question back yes. on that map. Is that a data hole in there, that gray area right at the top of uh, the Gulf of California? Right here. Yes, it very much is a data hole. Yes, that, that hasn't been done. <laughs> yes, so, I mean, you would imagine that this is going to extend across here, right? Absolutely. Um, in terms of uh, employment potential uh, in, uh, in Mexican border states, and uh, the research that we're carrying out is focusing on Sonora, um, just to get an idea of what uh, can be done there. But of course, we, this can be extended into Baja California. And when we're talking about uh, uh, the building of solar panels, that's actually in Baja California where we focused our attention. But basically, more than one uh, job per megawatt in the production of solar panels. Um, in the installation of uh, solar panels, we're looking at around 35 jobs per megawatt of installed power in, uh, in residential and business, small business applications. And then we can sort of double that by saying that for each job that's created in the manufacturing and installation, one more is created in the research, financing, and consulting area, and, and financing, uh, sorry, and, um, and we have to say here that there's a problem because at the moment, most of this work that's being done on research, financing, consulting is happening outside of Mexico. This is the, the part of uh, the equation that Mexico is failing to build up on, I think. There's, there's a potential there very, very easily to start uh, building up the installation of solar panels in residential and business applications across northern Mexico um, under the right conditions. But what we don't have is that we do not have the infrastructure to be able to take advantage of that. Now, some of you, I, I imagine, will have visited the, t uh, the Kyocera plant in Tijuana um, in Baja California. Um, which is an impressive facility. They produce around 300 megawatts per year of, of solar panels entirely for export to the United <coughs> States of America. They have an entire second floor of that facility there, which is waiting. It's empty right now, but it's waiting to produce solar panels for the Mexican market. But the demand isn't there right now. Well, the demand is there, but the conditions aren't right for that to happen. And they're hoping that uh, if, uh, as prices begin to come down and as... Um, uh, if the Mexican government can actually create the right incentive structure, then this is a, an industry that will grow in the near future. So the solar development drivers, uh, as, as a preliminary conclusion from the work that we've done, um, is that uh, the opportunities are, are coming from, well, the, the quality of the resource, demand from the United States. Um, the pricing of electricity in Mexico is a very, very interesting one. This CFE pricing right here. Um, as some of you may know, in Mexico, if you consume a little amount of electricity, you get a huge subsidy on your electricity bill. You consume a little bit more, the subsidy drops. When you reach a certain level, you start paying a very, very high price for electricity. And once you reach that, that highest level, you pay that price for electricity for all of your consumption. That creates an opportunity for solar panels. Because if you're consuming a lot of electricity, and then you can install solar panels which bring you down to the next level down of pricing, or ideally down to the lowest level of pricing, then it makes economic sense without any kind of subsidy. So in this case, subsidies on electricity actually work in favor of solar power, even though it's not a direct subsidy for, for solar, which is largely what the industry is working on in Mexico. And it's a very small, incipient industry in terms of residential applications, but that's the, the logic that they're working on. Um, rural applications that I've mentioned, the technological advances in bringing down the cost of, uh, of solar panels, and also increasing the quality of solar panels. And there's been some very, very interesting work being done on that recently. Um, and lastly, the cost of building local transmission lines. Um, in Mexico, there is a coverage in, uh, in urban areas of 97.6% for, for electricity supply. In rural areas, it's around 96%. And that sounds pretty good. And if you compare it with Central America, it's, it's, it's awesome. But then you think, well, Mexico's got a population of over 110 million people. So you've got over 5 million people who do not have access to the electricity grid. One of the reasons why they don't have access is because it just simply doesn't make economic sense to build the transmission line from the main part of the, the grid out to their uh, remote location. And this is where solar panels, I think, have um, a, a, a potentially highly positive impact. And uh, we can have a conversation about that later on in terms of how that changes people's lives. The obstacles, however cost and financing, really a lack of public awareness. People do not consider solar panels. It's, a, it's an upper middle class thing in Mexico. Um, and people think about it for heating their pool, um, but not really understanding how you can actually have a, a real impact upon your electricity bill. 
Um, the problems are for developing large-scale solar facilities is that the transmission uh, lines are not there. So here, transmission working against the, uh, um, the development of solar power in Mexico and really the lack of, of political interest. Over the past few months, I've had a number of meetings with Mexican senators to talk to them from border states, to talk to them about um, solar energy and renewable energies in general, and complete and utter ignorance of projects that are underway in their own states, not understanding what the, the potential is here. And one of the things that I'm going to be doing over the next six months, and hopefully into the next Congress as well in Mexico, is to be looking at uh, um, as how we can raise that awareness for all areas of renewable energy. Um, the biogas part of the report has been written by uh, a former colleague of mine who's now at, the, at Berkeley University, um, Omar Romero, who has uh, produced uh, work on uh, municipal solid waste. Uh, and originally we, we set out to look at uh, agricultural applications of, uh, of, of biogas. Um, and unfortunately, we just the, the data is not out there to produce reliable calculations of how much biogas can be derived from um, uh, from farming in, in in northern Mexico. But we do have good data in terms of municipal solid waste. And so the focus here is uh, is, uh, is is threefold. One is that you know because of the greenhouse gas emissions, which I mentioned earlier on, rising greenhouse gas emissions at the uh, at the at the border. This is one area where it's relatively easy to have a, a positive impact. Secondly, the, uh, the problems of finding enough space for municipal garbage, which is a common problem around the world, um, but, uh, but is also there in border states. And uh, the treatment of municipal garbage uh, and uh, separating the organic stuff out and turning it into, into methane really does help to deal with that challenge of finding new space. And then the wasted economic potential in terms of uh, generating electricity uh, and in terms of uh, money that's being lost there for the, uh, for the private bu uh, businesses that run landfill sites. Um, this is a nice little slide. We have uh, available outside some discs of, uh, of a book that we put together with USAID. Um, it was published earlier on this year, um, uh, which is an overview of the renewable energy sector in Mexico. It gives you a comprehensive treatment of, uh, of each of the, uh, the major sectors in renewable energy in Mexico. And just to give you an idea of the, uh, of the, the various benefits that come from uh, building up a biogas industry, and these are generally applicable to, the, to, to all of Mexico, or in fact any country. So you have the energy benefits, you have the, the benefits of treating um, waste and reducing uh, landfills, uh, si uh, sites, et cetera. Um, the, uh, the environmental impact, obviously, in terms of greenhouse gases. Um, the smell, of course, which is a very, very important factor. Um, I'll never forget one day in my, my distance past, um, I, I had to spend a day at a, at a landfill. Um, long story, my apartment had burned down. They'd taken all of the stuff that they'd, they'd taken off that, uh, that building site, dumped it there. I had to find my passport. And I spent a day <laughs> sifting through a municipal landfill. Uh, it was not fun. Uh, plus, it was in Canada in January, and that was not fun either. But anyway, I found my passport, believe it or not. Um, but the smells that come off a landfill site, if you haven't spent time around one, is, is really quite extraordinary. And for the local population, this is a real benefit. If you can capture that methane and reduce the, that, that, that really nasty smell in the, in the local environment, that's a positive impact there. Okay, so what is Mexico's, Mexico's potential in, in biogas development? Um, a nice little quote here. Um, from Dr. David Bransby, the infrastructure for the collection of municipal solid waste is already in place and paid for, and those who collect and dispose of it get paid for their services. This results in very low cost and low risk, making MSW a no-brainer feedstock for launching the cellulosic bio biofuels industry. And I think that tells us a lot. And, and for those of you who have spent time in Mexico and you know how important the municipal garbage industry is there, the pepinadores who go through and pick out everything, and they do their recycling and separation of, uh, uh, of garbage already, this is, I mean, the infrastructure is in fact in place to make this happen relatively easy, easy, easily. Um, at present in Mexico, uh, municipal solid waste is a tiny percentage of all biofuel production. And so we can see that there is a, there's, there's, there's great potential there to, to build it up. Um, and, and lastly, that uh, the, uh, it's, it's there. It's, it's ready to, uh, to, be, to be separated. It's ready to be, to be harvested. And uh, it can become a fundamental piece of Mexico's renewable energy matrix. Now, these are quotes directly from the report that will, that will come out in, uh, in January. Northern Mexico is an ideal location to center a growing municipal solid waste-based biofuel industry. First and foremost, it has the advantage of cheap land, 
abundant MSW feedstock, and inexpensive labor. Not only is labor cheap, but it comes with a significant level of training already in country due to the wide employment footprint of Pemex. And this is important to think about what are the things that Mexico ha already has to allow us to take advantage of this. Additionally, with improvements that have been and are continuing to be made in Mexico's roadway systems, manu systems, manufacturers will be able to access a far wider range of feedstock opportunities and markets in which to sell finished products both domestically and abroad. Now, this is, uh, this is something which we, we haven't really thought about, is like, what, are the, the, what is the infrastructure that's already in place in the country, sort of the physical infrastructure, the human infrastructure that, uh, that can make this, make this possible. And the cities that have the appropriate characteristics for this type of situation are Monterrey, Torreon, Juarez, and Tijuana, to a lesser extent Chihuahua. And that's <coughs> largely because of density of human population and the amount of, uh, of garbage that is generated on a, on a daily basis. And so we have some, some estimates here about the biogas potential from, uh, from Mexican uh, border states here. Um, uh, sorry, from municipal solid waste uh, feedstock potential. And you can see and there's various calculations here. So um, we have an, an estimate here about how many metric tons of municipal solid waste are produced annually. We know that, that number. That's, that's reliable information. And then depending upon how efficient the process is for getting biofuels out of municipal solid waste, we have different calculations here. So 120 gallons per metric ton, 70 gallons per metric ton, or 40 gallons per metric ton. And we're looking at a significant potential here for generating uh, renewable biofuels uh, on an ongoing basis uh, de uh, deep into the future. And the example that uh, most people call on is uh, to, to highlight the, the real potential for this is a, a biogas <coughs> project in Monterrey, which uh, BON here in Nuevo Leon, um, which uh, generates electricity from methane, captured directly there at the site. Um, the big thing about this project, I think, is that, as we'll see with, with other renewable energy projects, is that the cost of generating electricity without any kinds of subsidy is lower than that produced by the Comisión Federal de Electricidad. So around 10% cheaper than what the CFE sells that electricity at. That electricity is bought by a number of clients, but one of them is the local municipality. And they use that for municipal lighting. Um, they've expanded that plant in recent years. In 2008, they added another 5 megawatts to the original 7 megawatts there. And it produces a savings for the municipal government of 50,000 pesos every month. Now, it's less than $5,000 a month, but that's money that is now not being spent on electricity. It's being spent potentially on other projects. And that gets us into whole questions of accountability and transparency. But ideally, that's what we would see. And then, of course, you have the mitigation of greenhouse, ga uh, greenhouse gases. So you've seen the mitigation of 800,000 tons of CO2 equivalent since 2003. The job creation from uh, potential from biogas projects um, at, at the border, the estimate that we have, just to cut a long story short, is between 700 and 1,500 jobs um, uh, over the next uh, couple of years. And these are ongoing jobs. Now, these are jobs that are not necessarily in the separation of garbage, but in the running of plants. And we're looking at a, a biofuels plant in Mexico that would, on average, employ around 24 people uh, a, a, a year. Now, two pictures here um, from my trip to, uh, um, to La Rumorosa. The little, uh, I know you're all looking at the dog because the dog's super cute. Um, <laughs> but uh, it, was, uh, it was a place that I always wanted to go. I'd always wanted to go to La Rumorosa because I'd read about it for years and I'd done research on it. I get there and uh, it's an impressive place. First of all, the wind that is there is extraordinary wind. I mean, it was, it was blowing hard that day, but it's, it's not just the strength of the wind. It's the fact it doesn't stop. And the great thing is to actually lean into the wind because that's the best way to stay upright. And at one point, you know, I, I played the game where you jump up into the air and you find yourself two meters back. And then immediately after that, my sunglasses flew off and they're now in, I don't know, Texas or something. Um, because I never got them back. The wind just doesn't stop. It's an extraordinary resource there in La Rumorosa. And what they've got there in La Rumorosa is a very small plant. It's a 10 megawatt plant right now, but they've done great things with it. The dog is there because the dog, as you can see, eyes are like that because it lives there at the plant and it can't open its eyes properly because the wind is blowing so hard in its face the whole time. It's the cutest little animal. It arrived there on the first day of construction and has never left. The workers feed it tacos every day and it's just a, it's a lovely little animal. But anyway, um, now these are numbers from a couple of years ago that show what um, uh, wind projects already exist um, in, uh, in Mexico and which ones are sort of under development. But the fact is this hides a lot of the other development which is actually underway. So if we look at what's going on right now, there are projects being developed across the border. The only state that I didn't really find anything significant happening in wind was Sonora. 
Um, but Nuevo León, for example, has taken this as a theme this year where they've, they've issued, they've published their wind atlas, and they reckon that they have over 11,000 megawatts of potential in, uh, in, in wind energy. And that is more than they require um, sort of to, 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 to drive the state. And so this is, this is something which is actually really, really exciting over the next, uh, next few years. The wind resource in Baja California, some of you will have seen this map before. Most of us focus our attention on this area right up at the very top here. That's where La Rumorosa is. Okay, and that's where the little doggy lives with, a, with a, the, the, the slitty eyes. But the wind resource goes all the way down. Now, we have enormous infrastructure challenges here, in particular of building transmission, but we'll talk about that in a, in a second. But uh, there's enormous potential here. So you're looking at, just up here, you're looking at around 5,000 megawatts of potential up there. That not counting anything that's happening in the rest of that Sierra that extends down northern Baja. All right. The case of La Rumorosa. Um, why is it important to us? Well, it's important because of its success story. It's important because it's a success story that was driven by the, um, by the state government. And the state government in, in Baja California um, got financing for this project. It was around $27 million and has done great things with that money and with that resource. Um, what they've done is the electricity that's produced from La Romorosa is sold to the municipality of Mexicali. Mexicali gets that electricity at a savings of around 5 to 10 percent on what they would normally pay to CFE. So the municipality saves money on a monthly basis. They use that for municipal lighting, for public lighting. <coughs> the money that comes back to the state government to run the project of La Romorosa 1 is money which is, pays the costs of, uh, of financing, of running the development, and then the profits that come out of that are turned back over to the people of Mexicali. Mexicali has a, a huge problem. It's one of the hottest places in Mexico, and people have to pay very, very high prices for their electricity because they all, they all spend so much on air conditioning every year that they reach that upper level of CFE pricing. What the state government has done is they've produced subsidies for 35,000 families in Mexicali, and they've directed it in, at uh, um, single-parent families, predominantly where the, uh, the head of the family is a woman, handicapped people and people of uh, pensioners, essentially. People who have the most problem in paying the electricity, uh, electricity bills. And, and these people are receiving up to a 50% subsidy on their electricity bill, which seems to me an enormously clever thing to do with a small-scale wind project. Um, in addition to all of those positive things that are happening in terms of the social dimensions, um, the people at uh, La Rumorosa are currently building a training center at the site where local universities will be able to come in and experience the running of a wind farm on a daily basis. Um, they're going to open it up for research opportunities. And the state government there, which is really one of the most forward-looking in terms of its energy policy, um, is working very closely with the universities to build up um, undergraduate and graduate degree programs on renewable energies. And this is really sort of the ideal case. And this is a great showcase as well. And what's happening now is we're seeing private firms coming into the area. Just across into sort of the next hill over, you've got uh, um, Clipper Wind Service, or Mexico Wind Services, which is run by Clipper, an American firm, which is uh, building a 72-megawatt plant there. Um, and, uh, and Sempra is, uh, is building an enormous plant um, right on the border with the United States with an eye to exporting to the U.S., and there are enormous local benefits there. If any of you have ever been to La Romorosa, there's nothing there because you wouldn't really want to live there because of the wind. But there are houses there, and in the summer, it's a place where people from Mexicali go to get away from the intense heat. But what you're seeing there is you now got a, um, a primary school, sorry, a, a secondary school there for the first time in its history. You've got money coming in terms of rents for the land, and you've got uh, a sense that things are beginning to change for this little town. Um, the obstacles, however, are, are still huge in terms of... Uh, uh, of building up the resource. You've got financing issues, you've got problems in terms of uh, there's no real subsidies available for, for wind energy in Mexico. There's one subsidy which is in, in the sense that you get a tax write-off for on your first year of profits, but that's it. Um, and then you've got the transmission, both local and transborder transmission. La Rumorosa plant isn't able to tap into the, the major backbone grid um, that runs right next door to it. It has to go onto a local transmission line, which is a tiny little one. It looks like it's going to blow over at any moment because CFE wouldn't let it add on to the, the capacity that's already there. And this is a real problem. Mexico has to think about build, putting in place that transmission infrastructure, and maybe in a public-private kind of way where the 
the, uh, the utility, the public utility builds the backbone and private sector is allowed to build small-scale transmission to tap into that. Okay. Just uh, one thing, uh, Tamaulipas is, uh, is uh, another focus for, uh, for wind energy, and there's uh, a couple of very exciting projects there. Um, I was speaking with somebody earlier on about how um, they're, they're studying right now the project that's happening at El Porvenir um, in Reynosa. Um, but uh, Los Vergeles in San Fernando is, uh, is, will have actually a bigger impact, and that is a 161 megawatt plant. Now, you think about the, um, the plant in La Romeros is 10 megawatts. Um, it's a $328 million project. Um, we're looking at 500 jobs in the construction phase over two years. Those are good jobs, um, plus 60 permanent jobs running the plant. Um, and this is to generate low-cost electricity again for municipal authorities, um, 5 to 10% savings, and it's used for hospitals, schools, public lighting, and public buildings. Now, what they haven't come through with right now is that idea of providing subsidies to the local consumers. Um, Going beyond the generation of wind energy, thank you. Going beyond the generation of wind energy, you have wind turbine manufacturing. And this is where the real uh, uh, sort of permanent jobs are, the sustainable jobs are. And Mexico has done a little bit in attracting these jobs so far. We see a couple of plants along the border that are producing wind turbines almost exclusively for export to the U.S. market. And that's the beginnings of, a, of an industry, a turbine industry in Mexico, which needs to be encouraged to put good quality jobs there on the border. And so if we're looking at the overall numbers for wind energy employment, then um, we're looking at uh, around six jobs per megawatt of, megawatt of turbine production, um, which produces around 150, 100 to 450 jobs per year per terawatt hour of installed capacity. And again, we can double those numbers in terms of the research, financing, consulting, etc., if that happens. And the example that I always quote to Mexicans is the example of the state of Texas and what's happened in particular in Sweetwater, Texas. And the fact that, you know, over the last 10 years, you've seen 10,000 jobs created in the, in the wind energy sector in, in, in Texas. And that, that's something that I think there's no reason why we couldn't see that repeated in Mexican northern states or northern Mexican states. The barriers to wind projects, though, and this is an interesting number. This is taken from, uh, I think, from, uh, from 10 years ago. But basically, the major um, barriers to wind projects development is still transmission. So if you look at the maps of where wind energy projects are happening around the world, people bin build wind farms not necessarily where the best wind is, but where the transmission lines are closest to the best wind, because that cuts your costs so much. So if we, if the, if we think about this on a, on a macro level, building transmission lines close to good resources makes a, a lot, of, lot of economic sense. And I know it's going to cost money, but the overall benefits far outweigh that. There's a whole section of my presentation which uh, I would uh, conclude on, but I can answer questions about later on, upon the challenges in terms of transmission um, in Mexico. Um, but I'll leave that uh, for, uh, for a later discussion so that Liliana has time to, uh, to tell me what she thinks. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks so much, Duncan. That was excellent. And we'll have a chance, hopefully, to have some questions at the end so you can get into some of those other details you didn't touch on. Uh, we also have with us today Liliana Ferrer, who, as I said, is the head of section for the political and border affairs at the Mexican Embassy here in Washington. Uh, she's an expert in her own right in border issues and several of the points that, uh, that, Mexicans touch, that Duncan has touched on, as well as in a number of other topics uh, that, that are not energy related or environment related. Uh, she's been a, a career foreign service officer since 1992. Uh, she's been the head of Congressional Affairs at the Embassy, as well as Deputy Chief of Mission uh, in a previous capacities. She's studied at, uh, at a number of top universities, including Harvard, uh, where she did research on lobbying in the United States. Uh, she actually helped me on a research project uh, along those same lines a few years back. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Liana will offer some comments and uh, perspective from the Mexican side. And she was well, thank you very much, uh, Chris. and, and uh, let me be clear on this. I'm particularly happy. I'm, I'm uh, perfectly happy just listening to you, Duncan. And uh, I've been having a wonderful time uh, listening to this uh, fascinating uh, subject that uh, that I, by no means, I was telling Andrew, uh, am I an expert on? But first of all, I would like to thank the Woodrow Wilson Center and obviously the program on Mexico, uh, Andrew and uh, and uh, and Chris, and uh, and tell you again that I'm very happy 
to be seated at the same uh, table uh, with uh, with this distinguished guest and expert, Duncan Wood, who, who has done uh, tremendous and very valuable work in the history of renewable energy uh, and also on the history of Mexico-U.S. collaboration uh, in this field. Lastly, I want to congratulate also uh, the, uh, the Good Neighbor Environmental Board for the presentation of its 14th report. Uh, I know that you're going to be presenting it at 2 p.m. I'm sorry uh, that I have to dash out uh, like Andrew does uh, to catch a flight uh, uh, from Mexico, but, uh, but I'm very happy uh, to see and, and again congratulate you for the keen interest uh, that, uh, that you have uh, expressed in fostering collaboration between Mexico and uh, the United States. Uh, let, me, let me begin by, uh, and I will uh, share with you some very general, very general comments, begin by saying that uh, cooperating in this arena is, uh, is important not only because I truly believe that it's a win-win uh, situation for both countries in more ways, more ways than one. Uh, policymakers are, uh, are really looking into decreasing uh, dependency on, on fossil fuels, and there are a number of reasons uh, for this. Uh, some are quite obvious, uh, protecting the environment, uh, uh, but also we have to, to take into account uh, that uh, we have to satisfy rapidly growing demands for electricity with population growth expected, I believe, in 2040 to reach around 9 billion uh, people. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a scenario also where we are seeing declining oil reserves, uh, but uh, very important to highlight, particularly because of its potential to create jobs, and jobs that are very much needed in both countries at a time where unemployment levels are still very high. And when we see that uh, we have yet to put the economic uh, recession behind. Um, but more importantly, because we need to look uh, to the future as well. As uh, strategic uh, partners, as neighbors that, uh, that we are, uh, and we also need to look at becoming uh, more competitive, more efficient, more productive, uh, and address, very important, uh, address the development challenges uh, that have so clearly been put uh, onto the table by Duncan today and the positive impact and the benefits that renewable energy can bring upon uh, uh, these development challenges that are today are present in Mexico. I also want to uh, quickly mention uh, uh, the issue of security. Security, no doubt, is at the forefront of uh, the agenda, uh, uh, at the forefront of the relationship between Mexico and the United States. Uh, and we are working together and pushing organized crime back in the spirit of, uh, with the spirit of shared uh, responsibility. But now that I have mentioned it, um, I, I do so because um, uh, I believe that today's presentation uh, makes it clear that the U.S.-Mexico relationship goes so much beyond the issue of security. Uh, there are no two countries, as you have heard uh, before, most likely, because there are many of you in this audience today that are Mexico experts. There are no two countries uh, that have such a rich, a rich a complex, a diverse, an intricate relationship such as Mexico and the U.S., particularly at the, at the border. I know that many of you are from border states here today. And uh, that, is, uh, that is, and you are living proof of it. Uh, we share a 2,000 mile plus border. Uh, you know uh, uh, the statistics. Uh, Mexico is the second largest market uh, for the United States uh, with 80% of this uh, trade uh, that surpasses 400 billion uh, crossing uh, by truck. So it's an incredibly uh, dynamic uh, border. We have uh, obviously both countries share uh, record numbers of legal crossings uh, at the border and, uh, and uh, also in addition to that, that we have a very vibrant uh, cultural and social exchange among our citizens uh, uh, that have coined the term of citizen diplomacy that goes well beyond the relationship uh, between uh, governments of both countries. And again, here uh, Duncan made a comment about the importance of creating social networks and having uh, <coughs> a, a more intense participation on behalf of, of communities. 
Um, I um, I want to also, uh, by saying this, that, that obviously we have a very important, uh, uh, significant Mexican-American community in the, in the U.S. and uh, a very important number of U.S. retirees that travel south to enjoy warmer climates and, uh, and, and wonderful lifestyles south, south of the border. So having said that, I mention it not just to once again put in the forefront the, the immense uh, uh, richness of our relationship, but also to, to make it clear uh, that it is not fortuitous that uh, our relationship is so important. It is not fortuitous that Mexico has its largest embassy uh, in Washington, D.C., that it has in any, any place of the world. Uh, the U.S. also has uh, uh, its second largest embassy in Mexico City, only after Iraq. Uh, and if you count the U.S. consulates, I was being told by some of our friends at the Department of State, if you count the U.S. consulates in Mexico, it becomes the largest representation that the U.S. has in the world. Um, so um, in, in that regard, that very clearly establishes where we stand, uh, not only in, uh, with regard to the political importance of the relationship, the economic important rela uh, importance of the relationship, that incidentally uh, commerce itself sustains six million jobs in the U.S. And again, going to the, uh, to the issue of jobs, um, I think uh, it is important to highlight this uh, once again. Um, Fresh produce, we are your number one supplier in the winter month, so well over 50% of, of veg vegetables and, uh, and fruits on U.S. Tables, uh, tables come from Mexico. But going back to energy and renewable energy, we are uh, also the second most important supplier of uh, oil to the United States only after Saudi Arabia. I mention uh, these uh, numbers again uh, to put uh, things uh, into context and, and, uh, and to uh, again express uh, uh, that, that it is tremendously important to continue to work together uh, in those areas that show great potential, where, where there is a clear uh, need, a, a real and immediate need uh, for further uh, work and collaboration, uh, and again also that uh, provide development opportunities for both, for both our, our communities, and, and such is the area of uh, renewable energy. Uh, like Duncan has mentioned, Mexico is uh, a truly in a privileged position to, in terms of, of the potential to generate uh, renewable energy. And, uh, and as he mentioned, there's a wonderful report that he authored uh, last year where he touches upon uh, the history of cooperation between both countries, which is long and, and multifaceted. Uh, it is uh, renewable energy today is crucial in the context of, of efforts to mitigate climate change, and we know of Mexico's and particularly uh, the current administration's leadership position in this issue as we hosted the Cancun COP16 uh, talks that uh, just recently concluded in Durban, uh, South Africa, the COP17. Uh, but uh, more importantly, that it has always been a development tool to bring energy and employment to uh, marginalized areas that are not connected uh, to the national grid. And, uh, and this, once again, brings to the forefront the issue of Baja California and the potential for exports uh, to U.S. states and particularly to, to California. Um, I do encourage you to, to, uh, to uh, read uh, uh, Duncan's work, the magnificent work that has been done by U.S. aid uh, for years now, uh, long-term work. They have worked on some fabulous mapping of, um, of, uh, of uh, wind, uh, wind energy uh, potential in central Mexico, uh, also geothermal uh, energy. Duncan touched upon uh, Cerro Prieto and, and the great potential that exists in Baja California. Um, I read uh, in your work, uh, and it uh, really uh, uh, surprised me that the potential of Mexico, and correct me if I'm wrong, is only second to Indonesia's apparently in the future, and that, uh, that, was, that was quite, uh, quite impressive. Um, but, uh, but again, there is great, great potential uh, in, uh, in wind and solar, uh, in solar energy, uh, uh, particularly for agricultural production uh, in, in so many ways. But Mexico is today looking, looking to the future. Um, both presidents have worked uh, closely 
uh, on this matter since April of 2009. Uh, Presidents Obama and, and Calderon signed the U.S.-Mexico bilateral framework on clean energy and climate change, and they both agreed on the importance of promoting clean energy. Uh, uh, Mexico has positioned itself, as I said, as an international leader in climate change and mitigation, uh, but uh, it is very important now for the country to invest um, heavily in both energy efficiency projects and in development of the renewal uh, energy sector. Uh, as the result of the state visit that President Calderon uh, uh, made to the United States uh, in May of last year, uh, the Cross-Border Electricity Task Force was announced, and as a result of this came uh, in October of 2010, uh, the celebration of uh, an important meeting in La Jolla, California, uh, U.S.-Mexico Cross-Border Electricity Stakeholder Forum. There were about over 70 uh, representatives of the, uh, of, of the U.S. and Mexico government, of industry, of the private sector, uh, that got together to discuss issued, uh, issues related to fostering uh, uh, increased uh, uh, the electricity uh, with an emphasis again on renewable energy and um, and particularly on California and maybe maybe Duncan can comment on this um, on this meeting um, uh, uh, in a couple of minutes because even though there is a, a great positive um, very good intentions from this meeting. I have heard that, unfortunately, there have not been very uh, uh, clear results uh, and uh, uh, clear advancements from, uh, from it. Um, both countries are also working intensely on a 21st century border program. Uh, and again, this is the, the plane that I'm going to be catching immediately after this event. Uh, the Executive Steering Committee is meeting in Mexico City. And uh, this is also, I believe, an important opportunity to discuss not only issues of security, uh, of uh, infrastructure building uh, among uh, both countries, but also projects perhaps related to renewable energy. Uh, Mexico is promoting large investments uh, from the private sector. Uh, we're encouraging a higher percentage, and here again, Duncan is the expert, so maybe he can comment on this. Um, there have been some important uh, investment projects taking place in Oaxaca, I believe. But here again, the issue of transmission comes to light in that even though there are important investments and important sources of, uh, of wind energy in the central part of Mexico, what are we going to do if the national grid is not fully integrated to um, to Baja and its potential to export to states as California. So um, on the U.S. side, uh, the Obama administration and the Department of State announced just recently, December 8th, the creation of a new office of the Undersecretary of, uh, for Economic Growth, Energy, and the Environment. I believe it's going to be headed by Robert Hormitz. And, um, and uh, the press bulletin stated that it will supervise, among other bureaus, that of energy resources and will be responsible for promoting, I quote, sustainable and balanced growth in the world economy based on sound environmental practices, increased energy di uh, diversification, and foster innovation through robust science, entrepreneurship, and technology policies. So with this, I just want to conclude by saying that there is a wonderful uh, uh, spirit on behalf of both countries uh, to work on this issue. There is great potential on behalf of Mexico, but what are the challenges? And this is a question I leave to the experts, uh, uh, such, as, such as Duncan Wood. Uh, development of resources in border areas will require close coordination and a unified approach on many fronts. And when considering the first element of collaboration, which is obviously the design, construction, operation of a, of a logical, efficient, and strategically placed uh, electrical transmission system, one cannot but, but stand back and try to think how uh, agreement between both countries will be reached as you face a diversity of agencies, both at the federal level, at the state level, if you include on the U.S. side uh, uh, regulatory agencies, the private sector, uh, energy enterprises, and on the Mexican side, it might be somewhat easier because most things, most decisions are made uh, from the public sector, be it uh, the energy ministry, CENER, or uh, CFE, but nevertheless, uh, uh, decisions have to be made on a consensus basis and in unison. Uh, so um, this is a challenge in itself, uh, incorporating uh, small and medium-sized 
uh, enterprises and industries on both sides of the border is, uh, is of tremendous importance if we really want to, to address uh, uh, development issues in the long term. Duncan, very right, uh, uh, rightly, and, and he, 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 he got right to the point, the importance of education in Mexico. Uh, Mexico needs to invest on education and training, uh, creating human capital. Perhaps we can use some of the structure that already exists in Pemex and, uh, and definitely raise awareness, the creation of a culture in Mexico of the importance of clean energy, green enterprises, clean solutions is, I believe, uh, uh, tremendously important. So finally, uh, I just want to say that there is a unique opportunity, uh, a unique window of opportunity, I believe, in the coming months, given the commitment that is expressed, uh, was expressed by Presidents Obama and Calderon, and, and in light of the political calendar that we are about to begin in January of next year by both governments, uh, this window of opportunity uh, is quite unique in, in setting a roadmap for the future and uh, for green and clean uh, economic development in this field. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Liliana. Uh, those are excellent remarks. We, I think you, you gave a number of things that uh, Duncan needs to now respond to and comment on. Perhaps we uh, can grab just a couple other questions from the audience, and then we'll just give Duncan a chance to, to respond. We're going to have uh, microphones because uh, we're on a webcast, so please introduce yourself, and there we go. Yeah, thank you. Hi, um, Cecilia Guion with Kyocera Solar. Um, thank you, uh, Duncan, for the presentation. Um, and uh, I, my question is for you. Uh, as you can imagine, we have been uh, going to Mexico for the last three years trying to develop a program. We think that Mexico has an advantage over the U.S. in that we will probably never have a, a national energy policy. But it's all at the state level, and the states are moving forward. Mexico is the complete opposite. We have an amazing opportunity to bring everybody in a room maybe this size and have everybody from Hacienda, from you know, the ministries and regulatory agencies, what have you. So who do you think, or what agency, who, is, who could be the champion or the connective tissue? Because it seems everything is in, play, in place. You have the technology, you have even the labor force that is you know, skilled or semi-skilled or on its way, but you just need somebody that can connect all of these things that are loose, all over the place, so do you have any idea? Thank you. I think we can collect one or two other comments or questions and then go back to Duncan for his final remarks. Yes, I think we have another one up here. Mm. <laughs> My name is Luis Olmedo with Comité Civico. I'm actually in the southern part of California, Imperial County, Mexicali area. So I, my question is, um, well, actually a couple of questions. Um, one is in regards to the uh, technologies like Sierra Prieto, geothermal. Um, you know, there's a lot of concerns about the technology that is currently being utilized, and actually there's a hot spot there of health issues and the way they manage the, 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 the waste. Or I mean, it's not up to at least U.S. standards, not that it's better or worse, but it's just not, not up to those standards. And, the other question is um, in regards to the Remurosa, and I believe it's a beautiful spot and affordable to most people who live in, in, in the part of Mexicali or Tijuana, and part of that is because you have to drill for water and wells, and, but it's beautiful, you know, so there's a lot of vegetation there. But I know there's also the concern when you're talking about transmission uh, cross-border uh, about the exportation of jobs, not that I don't believe in creating jobs on both sides of the border, mm -hmm. but is there is that concern about uh, what point you're independent in terms of creating renewable energies, and at what point you're also exporting jobs. And one question over here. Yes, I'm Dr. Sam Hancock of uh, Emerald Planet here in Washington, D.C., and looking at the, the absolute uh, a broad opportunity for production of uh, solar and, and wind across uh, northern Mexico uh, and, and, and not having it to be grid-centric but having it diffused throughout the populations, uh, what could be the potential for expansion of investments and also economic development 
uh, throughout that region and not try to make it uh, dependent on the grid, but keep it diffused uh, you know, community to community or state by state. Good. Right. Let me dive in because uh, we're running out of time. All right. So um, just in response to uh, some of the things that, uh, that Liliana said, um, first of all, the Cross-Border Electricity uh, Stakeholders Forum has been one of the biggest disappointments, I think, uh, of the past couple of years. And the fact is, is that um, I've heard from both sides that they're blaming the other to say, well, there's a lack of interest in Mexico City or there's a lack of industry in the DOE, uh, lack of interest, sorry, in, the, in DOE. Um, and I, I, there's no lack of interest from the private sector who are trying to drive this forward. I mean, you, know, you hear it from them as well. It's like, what, are, what on earth are they doing? Why aren't they meeting? Why are we not seeing results here? But the fact is, I think that many people have now almost given up on the forum. I think I, I hear people in the private sector who say, well, you know, that's clearly not going to, that's not going to do the job for us. There was so much excitement to begin with. And that's something, and, and, and I, I mentioned it in the, uh, in the presentation later on, is to say this is something that really needs to have some new life breathed into it. Whether that happens in an election year or whether it happens hopefully, you know, after the election, then, I, I mean, at some point somebody needs to take this. Cause it's, a, it's a useful forum, I think, but it just hasn't been taken full, fully advantage of yet. Um, in terms of the grid, um, there's a, a chart here that I want to show. Um, there we go, of the Mexican grid. And, and for those of you who understand Mexican electricity, um, there are, in fact, three grids in Mexico. There, so there's the, the main national grid, then there's Baja California Norte and Baja California Sur. The fact is that because of the geography of Mexico, you can see the lines go north to south, essentially. And my point about the Mexican grid, I think, is that this provides us with a really interesting opportunity, uh, a good pretext to build more cross-border transmission. Now, the argument is always heard uh, from the renewable energy industry is we need to get our clean electricity into California. Okay, that's what they want. But these should be bidirectional links, of course, and there's a very small number of bidirectional links that already exist across the border. My argument is that why not take these bidirectional links as a way of getting Mexican clean electricity to the place in the United States that want it, but let's also import cheap electricity from the United States at certain times of day Electricity is much cheaper in the United States than it is in Mexico. Import that cheap electricity into Mexico. You've got it in the grid. Why not take it all the way down to the south of Mexico and into Central America where there's a, a definite deficit? Mexico becomes a broker for North American electricity entering into Central America, and that's an enormous economic uh, potential there that nobody has even thought about tapping. That's going to require infrastructure investments on cross-border. It's going to require a strengthening of the, of the grid in Mexico. But the part of Central America, I can just show here, it's already happening. Central America is integrating its electricity grid through something called the CPAC, the Sistema Integral uh, Electrica para América Central. And that is an enormous market that's waiting to be tapped. Now, I'm talking about selling sort of conventional electricity, but electrons are electrons. Um, and so once you've got it there, you can sell it into Central America. And it gives you an excuse, an economic pretext to build the cross-border transmission um, to get Mexican clean electrons, if you like, into the United States. Um, uh, Liliana also mentioned uh, about the, the multiple challenges um, that, that face us ahead. And, and I think they're the challenges that we all recognize. Um, there's the public awareness thing. There's financing. There's the transmission one. But so many of these can be solved by the political will, and the political will just really isn't there at the moment, despite the high-level statements. Um, we had a, an opportunity whilst Carlos Pascual was U.S. ambassador in, in, in Mexico. Um, this was an issue that was close to his heart. And whatever Mexicans may say about the, the former ambassador, the guy was, was, was truly enthusiastic about this, and he was anxious in driving this issue forward. And that was an exciting time when he first started talking about these things. And he was a man who understood the issue. That's what, probably what we need. We need another, another champion, as it were, um, from the US and Mexican governments in the, in the other country who can really recognize this. And so I would urge you to speak to, to your ambassador, um, Mr. Sarokan, and to say, you know, please you know, pick up this and, and, and make it an issue once again. Uh, and that brings me to Cecilia's question about the champions in Mexico. Um, and a thank you once again, Cecilia, for hosting us when we went up to, uh, to Tijuana. Um, it's very difficult to see who in the Mexican energy, po uh, energy policy community at the governmental level is going to really take this. It's a secondary issue um, or even a tertiary issue. I mean, first of all, you have oil. 
and, and oil is, is always going to dominate the, the agenda, the energy agenda in Mexico. Now you've got the potential for shale gas development in Mexico. So shale gas is the, 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 the theme of the day, as it were, in Mexico. And some people, and I think this is worth thinking about, some people said, well, with cheap shale gas coming online, is, is that the end for renewable energies? And I would say, no, absolutely not, partly because natural gas makes a perfect backup for renewable energy generation. So I think they go very well hand in hand. But uh, so you say, well, OK, it's, it's not going to be the people who are focused on oil and gas. What about the electricity sector that has to do it? it, it, it ideally, it needs to come from, from CFE. But CFE is not really interested. And CFE is not, div it is not I investing in, uh, in renewable energies. They're letting the private sector do that. It needs to be the private sector that drives this. The private sector has to organize itself in a much better way than it has so far. And I think that there really needs to be um, a, uh, some kind of forum that's created from the private sector that is able to represent the interest, not just of the renewable energy sector, but of the private sector in general, in terms of lobbying CFE and CENER to get cheaper costs for electricity and for having a more flexible energy policy in the country. And uh, that will have to happen at the federal government, because as you say, we do have the possibility of having a federal energy policy. However, I would say that certain states can play a role in that. And so we need to find champions amongst the governors of certain states. And Baja California, as you know, has been one of those, those champions. And it hasn't had a huge impact at the national level. But if you were able to get the governors of, of, of Oaxaca, Tamaulipas, Baja California, um, and, uh, and other states across Mexico that really have an interest in developing renewable energies because the potential is there, I think that could, ha could make a difference. Um, Luis. Um, the standards uh, at, at Cerro Prieto and uh, you know, the environmental problems there. As, as, you, as you probably know, Mexico has pretty much the same environmental standards as the United States. Um, they're, not, they don't, they're not called the same thing, but they're more or less, I mean, they're equivalent. The problem we always have is implementation, of course, of, of, those, uh, um, of those environmental standards. And it's, it's, it's a common problem. And yes, I, I'm, I'm aware of the problems at uh, Cerro Prieto with uh, um, sort of the spillovers. That, that, that occur there. Um, people have said the same thing, of course, about other energy projects that have taken place just across the border in Mexico, um, whether it's Sempra's natural gas uh, you know, plant and the emissions that come from there back into California. Um, and then, of course, all the questions about um, are wind farms actually environmentally friendly, the standards you need to put in place for bird patterns, et cetera, et cetera. I would say that I think we're, we're moving in the right direction on that. There's still work to, work to do. But I would, I would argue that the um, environmental standards should be one of the areas that we're looking at in North America in general in terms of a, of a harmonization and of mutual recognition. Um, and beyond that, capacitation. So to actually help a country like Mexico to implement these on, in a reliable way. And the second part of your question was on the export, export of jobs. Um, I, I actually had this question myself when I began the project because I was like, well, if you're developing green jobs, as it were, in Mexico, those green jobs aren't going to be in the United States. But of course, it's not zero sum. Because what's happening right now is that if you build up wind energy capacity in Mexico, where do those turbines come from? And those turbines are coming from from abroad. Now, there's no reason why they couldn't come from the United States. I mean, some of them are coming from Spain, some of them are coming from Germany, etc. But, but a lot of them are now coming from the United States. And so those good jobs are taking place in the United States. So what if my dream comes true and you build up a wind turbine manufacturing capacity in, in Mexico? Are those green jobs that are coming out of the United States? In some way, yes, they are. I mean, because they won't get to be created there. But I would say that this is a, a pie that's going to get bigger and bigger over time. And so you're looking at job creation. And as we all know, North America as a region, and particularly Mexico and the United States as two countries, they depend upon each other for their competitiveness, not just within the region, but globally. And so I would say that, that what benefits one you normally does benefit the other. And I think that's, a, that's an attitude and, a, and an understanding that we need to do a better job of in North America in, in telling the, the general public about that so that Mexico is not seen as a rival and the United States is not seen as a rival. But this is a, this is a positive of some kind, and particularly at the border. I mean, as we all know, these are entirely interdependent, integrated communities. And so jobs on one side of the border means wealth for the other side of the border as well. Duncan? Yes. I'm told that our, our guest from the White House is outside the door. We ought to we go. We need to make a tr quick transition to our next panel. So I'm sorry to, to cut off the last I'm questions. Sam, Perhaps the conversation is going to happen okay. afterwards. But thank you very much to both of you for being here. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you.